Hello, everybody. Welcome to Michael's Record Collection. I'm very happy to have back on the show with me, Brian Colburn from the Excellent Playlist Wars podcast. Brian, thanks for being a, a repeat uh, guest. Mike, thanks for having me again, man. I'm excited to talk some music with you again. Yeah, I've been uh, listening to your show. You guys have been doing a great job over there. And, uh, you know, I will silently yell at you guys in my car when I, I disagree vehemently, <laughs> but, um, uh, and sometimes I will, I will, uh, agree vehemently with you as well. <laughs> That's kind of the fun of the show. We are humble in the fact that we know that none of our opinions are the right ones. They are just that opinions, mm -hmm. but the discussion that kind of goes in between why the songs we picked for the song, for our respective playlists versus what the other people picked it's always fascinating to me when you just throw a topic out there and you see what that topic means in people's heads. And that's the part that songs and topics resonate differently person to person, experience to experience. And hearing that flesh out over 10 songs to me is fascinating. So I'm always like excited about the conversations we have because of the fact that in my brain, I could say, there's no way they can't not have this song. And then they don't and explain why. And I'm going, interesting. Like, yeah. I never thought of it that <laughs> way. And that's kind of the fun of the show. Yeah. And sometimes it, you can't make a decision. You have to, you have to roll with a, a, a theme. Like if you're, if you're going with a band and you, you think, well, I'm going to, I'm, you know, I have all these songs I love, but I have to go with some kind of cohesive playlist. So I don't want to bring too many slow songs into it. I want to rock out. So you kind of might pass up a ballad for a, a rocker just to stay consistent. So there's a lot of different strategies involved. Brian, for those who missed the previous uh, time you were on and when I had uh, your co-host Gomez on, uh, briefly uh, tell us about your podcast again. Sure. Playlist Wars is a very simple format, but seems to work pretty well. At least I hope it does. It's one topic, three playlists. You decide who's best. Meaning, Gomez, myself, are the two co-hosts, and we bring a third person on, and we'll pick up, we'll pick out a topic. For instance, Mike, you were on for the songs of 1971, mm -hmm. and we each created a 10-song playlist that we each felt best represented the songs of 1971. And they went in three completely different directions, as a topic like that would, because you're opening up the, the playbook. Yeah. All genres, all musical styles, all walks of life. And we came up with three different playlists. And then at the end of the, basically the show is us pleading a case for our 10 songs as we mm -hmm. kind of reveal them one through 10. And then the listeners vote for which one they felt, quote unquote, got it right. On the episode, we call it a winner. But at the end of the day, it's more kind of a study to see I don't want to say study because that sounds really nerd of me, but <laughs> it's kind of a case study, if you will, to see where the people who listen to the show resonate the most. Because even at the end of the day, none of our three playlists are correct answers, nor are the ones that get voted. It's just opinions mm -hmm. of a song and opinions of a playlist and then opinions of those opinions. That's but true. The conversation that engulfs all of that is what I love about the show. Yeah, it's it was a lot of fun to be on and and to try to narrow down a whole year's worth of music into 10 songs is is a thankless task. It had me cursing you guys' names, but uh in the end I I I went with my gut and I I paid for it because <laughs> I I am a deeper track type person. I could have gone with the big uh popular songs but i had some songs that barely charted and um you know but i enjoyed talking about 1971 with you guys especially since 1971 is something that i can i barely have a few memories of that year you guys have no memories of that year <laughs> no not at all and the, the beauty of that is the memories i have of it are all that of me growing up because my parents played a lot of those albums growing up yeah, and it creates different memories because we didn't live the scene. So to speak, we kind of heard these songs post-mortem, if you will, mm -hmm. you know, a decade after the fact, 
So the scene had completely changed by 1981 when I was four or five years old. Yeah. And by that point, hearing those songs, it was a different experience wrapped in a completely different musical landscape. Mm -hmm. So hearing how the three of us kind of approached it, I thought was absolutely fascinating. Yeah. And the other thing, too, is that you we all have our own experiences. You have experiences of growing up where you grew up. And I have experiences growing up where I grew up, which are vastly different places. And so different parts of the country don't necessarily – your classic rock station isn't necessarily playing all the same songs my classic rock station is playing, even though there's a lot of – you know, there, there, there's a lot of homogenous uh, radio stations that are owned by the same groups. There were songs that did better in the Midwest than on the East Coast, and those still mm -hmm. kind of resonate in the playlist. So it was a lot of fun. Uh, if anyone's wondering, I did not win. I don't know where I placed because you guys just announced the winners. So I'm guessing last, but uh, <laughs> I will. Uh... I honestly, once they announced the winner in my brain, I'm like, okay, on to the next one. <laughs> I know yeah. Gomez, we'll spoil it. Gomez won that one, but I'm not going to say what we played because I would like people to go back and listen to that and kind of listen and see if they agree. Yeah. But the way the voting went, but Gomez, again, he's the youngest of all three of us. So to me, it was kind of a Cinderella story. So in that <laughs> regard, I was like, dude, bravo. Like you're the farthest removed from 1971 and you beat both of us who were older than him. So yeah. And he went, he went a much different way than we went with his list. So uh, yeah, it resonated with your, with your, your voters. And, you know, obviously you probably have, you probably have listeners that vote religiously every week and then others they only just kind of weigh in on the shows that they like or the you know the topics that they're into. So um, who knows on any given day, like you you won't necessarily be getting votes from the same group of people or or the people with the same interests. Right, exactly. It all depends on on the show. Like we did a rush episode recently, and I was blown away watching the ticker of votes actually changing in real time worldwide. <laughs> like votes coming from all over the world. <laughs> and I was completely blown away by the amount because Rush fans are passionate. So not only were we getting votes, we were getting messages and people were hitting us up on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook telling us why the songs we chose were wrong and why their version was different. <laughs> and this conversation around Rush's music completely blew my mind that week. I loved it because... I was hearing people's rationale for why they thought a certain song belonged, even in a different track spot than where I had it. Oh, you can have that at track five. It needs to be track four, and here's why. And that kind of passion is what I love about what we all do in this kind of music podcasting space yeah. is basically wax poetic about our favorite songs. So that's why I'm so excited to be doing it here again tonight. Yeah, we get to nerd out. And that was a, that was my favorite recent uh, episode that you did with uh, friends of the show, Steve and Jerry from the uh, Something for Nothing Rush uh, fan cast, which is a great show also. So go check that one out as well. Yeah, absolutely fantastic. Those guys are encyclopedias on Rush. Couldn't say any any bad things about them. Two unbelievable guys there. And they are, and they're they're very humble. They they do a lot of research, but yet they're very humble to the point where they will tell you on their show repeatedly that they don't know anything. <laughs> None of us do, really. Yeah, at the end that's of the true. day, <laughs> yeah, we just we're just music nerds, and we 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 like to talk about music. I I remember my uh, my wife. We were watching the uh, the movie High Fidelity, oh. and. You know, the guys are sitting around in the record store talking about music and my wife looks at me and goes, that's you. And you should have responded, that's the dream. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I didn't deny it. I was like, yeah, yeah. I, I like to think we're not quite as pretentious, but we probably are. <laughs> <laughs> Just a little bit. <laughs> yeah. So what we're doing today, Brian has come on the show. We're going to talk a little bit about one of our favorite uh, albums, our favorite Pat Benatar album. Precious time. Look at that. Got the CD. Got the LP right there. Mine's yeah, on the hold shelf. It like this. There, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Mine's on the shelf. I forgot to get it down before the show. I usually do, but the the podcast listeners aren't going to know any different. But the the video watchers will see it. And um, yeah, this is Pat's third studio album, Precious Time, released July sixth, nineteen eighty one, on Chrysalis Records, and it followed 
In the Heat of the Night in 1979 and Crimes of Passion 1980, the all-difficult third album. Critical time for, for Pat, and she'd had some success, obviously, and this album dropped right before MTV, so it wasn't it wasn't it get it did get an MTV boost eventually, but it didn't right away because there wasn't MTV yet uh, going. It was recorded in Los Angeles at uh, Sound City Studios and Goodnight LA Studios, and so a little bit dif uh, different change of scenery for uh, the Brooklyn-born Pat. And uh, it was produced by Keith Olsen and Neil Giraldo, uh, but really by Neil Giraldo because Keith Olsen had done. Uh, the Crimes of Passion album produced yep. that, and reportedly they weren't real happy at what they regarded as Keith just kind of blowing them off and and being absent, and and Neil supposedly did a lot of the work on that album as a result. So on this one, they insisted that Neil get uh, producer credit, and he he ended up really kind of producing the album, uh, although Keith's name is on it, and he probably did some things, but. Probably not nearly as much because reportedly he was in the studio even less for this album. And I think that amounted to some magic because this is Pat Benatar's most hard rocking album. And I use hard rock in quotes because she is kind of known as a rock artist, but does lean more towards the pop side of rock. But this album is, make no mistakes about it, a meat and potatoes rock album for her. And it's my all time favorite pat benatar album and it's mine too and before i get into why it's my favorite tell me why it's your favorite honestly probably just because of that it is a rock album i am a rock guy it's in my blood it's in my dna mm -hmm. and these songs they don't have the 80s sheen on them that you're going to get from get nervous and beyond that's when she really started embracing that 80s sound. Around 83, 84, a lot of artists mm -hmm. did. Eric more Clapton, keyboards. Yep. More keyboards. It was kind of, I called it the Phil Collins effect, where he kind of got his hands into a lot. Not that he did anything with Pat Benatar, but mm -hmm. I call it that because you could just tell a lot of these artists. I The one I go to in my mind is, I think, uh, Behind the Sun by Eric Clapton. You could just tell that that was producers driving that album not eric and yeah some of pat benatar's 80s stuff i felt had that vibe but there's touches of rock throughout all of those albums a each album has a touch of rock in it 82's get nervous has my favorite pat benatar song of all time which is her cover of shadows of the night however in my humble opinion that song would have made precious time a perfect 10 tracks because that song sounds like it was recorded for precious time but held for get nervous because the rest of get nervous goes off in different directions mm -hmm. precious time is all of the same vibe as my favorite pat benatar song so to me it's not a missed opportunity because it probably didn't happen that way but as a listener i hear that neil Giraldo vibe that hard rocking sound, his guitar work shining through with Pat Benatar giving a little bit more grit, a little bit more edge, mm -hmm. and a little bit more rock to her voice. Because she could go very smooth and very sweet, which we'll talk about on this album. Mm -hmm. But then when she kicks it up a notch, she could scream with the best of them. And she has a fantastic hard rock voice. And that's why this is my favorite album of hers. Yeah, that's great. It's For me, it's just very simple. It was the first one of hers that I got. And you always kind of gravitate toward that first one. Your your first one usually is the one that you you bond with that means something to you because you went through more time with it. You went through, you know, it reminds you of that the time that you got it, the times that you were listening to it, and you it it just sort of cements itself in your mind. And I, I know that among Pat Benatar fans, this is this is not widely regarded as her best album. It was her only number one album. But it wasn't – I've read – in fact, I read a lot of uh, – I was reading Rate Your Music today, and there were a lot of not-so-nice things said about this album on Rate Your Music, which I don't get, but, you know, we, we're all different. Of course. If we did an episode <laughs> on Pat Benatar, I could tell you my top ten list would have several songs from this album. 
Yeah, for sure. Same here. So uh, as I mentioned, this peaked at number one on the Billboard 200. It was her only album to reach number one in any country, which is hard to believe. Uh, it was number two on the Billboard U.S. Rock Albums chart. So it was one overall in the hot in, in the 200 and, and uh, number two in the Rock Albums chart. Number two in Canada and New Zealand. Number eight in Australia. Nine in Sweden. 28 in Norway, 30 in the UK, 42 in Japan, 46 in the Netherlands, and 57 in Germany. A worldwide smash hit. It was also uh, number 95 on the year-end Billboard 200 that year, which seems incredibly low. Uh, yeah, it does, really. It was number 18 in the year-end uh, chart in Canada, 39 in New Zealand, and 63 in Australia. Again, did very well. Pat herself said on uh, Redbeard's in the studio program that it went platinum in 13 days, which is incredible. <laughs> Back when people bought albums. I mean, think about that. These were physical copies at that time. Yeah, no streaming, none of that. It was, uh, you know, no downloads. It was you bought a physical copy of the record or tape. So pretty good. Not bad at all. Uh, double platinum in the U.S. and Canada. Gold in France and New Zealand. Only two singles from this album. Yeah. Fire and Ice and Promises in the Dark. And uh, there, were, there were other videos. There was a video for the title track, Precious Time. We'll talk a little bit more about that. But uh, you know, when I look at this album, especially Side One, to me, Side One is a perfect album side. We're going to talk about that. I could not agree more. When I think of Precious Time, I could tell you right now, beyond a shadow of a doubt, this is one of the 80s best album sides across all genres. Easily in my top 10, maybe in my top five, and possibly in my top three. It is that strong. It is a perfect album side. Just came up with a great idea for your show. <laughs> top 10 best album, album sides. sides. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that would be interesting. All right, so here's the personnel on this album. Pat Benatar, obviously, lead and backing vocals. Neil Giraldo, lead guitar, keyboards and backing vocals. Scott St. Clair Sheets played rhythm guitar. Roger Capps played bass. For me, the unsung hero of Pat's band is Myron Grombacher, the drummer. Mm -hmm. uh, Alan Pasqua played piano. Uh, there were... Multiple sax players on Evil Genius, Gary Hel uh, Herbig, Joel Peskin, Tom Scott, Larry Williams, and Keith Olson, the uh, <laughs> pro producer, played tambourine on Fire and Ice. <laughs> so couldn't he get, They couldn't get Myron to do that? <laughs> they, they really got their money's worth out of Keith, the Chrysalis Records did. <laughs> wow. Um, so what do you think of this this band? When you think of... of this album, I think that the the rhythm section of Caps and Grombacher for me don't get nearly enough credit. They don't. I mean, they're not household names by any stretch of the imagination. Everybody kind of knows who Neil is, and they know he's a good guitar player. Pat obviously steals the show, but for me, that that bassist and that drummer, they just put down a rock solid foundation for everything that those guys put on top of it. Yeah, and this album is definitely one where I'm going to be talking about this a few times tonight. The dynamics in this album are simply impeccable. I mean, this album is dynamic. Going from soft and sultry to an explosion to different styles between the verse and the chorus, timing changes, everything. These guys are locked in. And it gives this opportunity for neil to just go crazy on top of all of it and there's times and flourishes where he does but neil is such an underrated hero on guitar because he knows exactly the right amount to play to every song and this album is a shining example of that because he never overstays his welcome or shines too bright to make it stick out of the song. And we're going to talk about specific examples of that tonight on these songs as we get to them. Why do you think Neil Giraldo never really 
captured the public's imagination in terms of guitar heroes. Everybody talks about, you know, the same names over and over. They don't, they don't typically mention Neil. Uh, they'll mention Neil Schoen. They'll, they'll mention, you know, Eddie Van Halen, obviously the very, you know, the very, uh, talented and and flamboyant guitar players who who are fast and, and can move across the fretboard but neil giraldo is not in that conversation often and he's just a fantastic guitar player i have a theory as to why that might be total theory but my theory on this is because it's pat benatar when you think tom petty and the heartbreakers you could say, oh, Mike Campbell, an amazing guitar player. When you think Pat Benatar, you think Pat Benatar. You don't think and the blank. If it was Pat Benatar and the blank, where the band had a name and it was part of the Pat Benatar to the point where Pat Benatar, I feel, saw this because that's why they go out as Benatar Geraldo now. Mm -hmm. not just Pat Benatar. She wanted him to have equal billing. So I feel like because it was the Pat Benatar show at the height of her career, it was guitarist be damned, no matter how good it is, Pat Benatar is the star. Whereas when it's wrapped in a band name, people seem to give different credit to different people mm -hmm. where need be. When you think of a Toto, you think of a Journey, you think of these amazing guitar players, Neil Sean, you know, uh, um, oh my Steve Lukather. Steve Lukather. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Had a brain, a brain just turned off there. It's, it's, it's a Monday. What can I say? Yeah. But yeah. That they're part of a band. So you kind of get to know all the band members. And with an artist, I felt like maybe some people didn't. And that's not a, it's not a dig either, but it's just a, what I'm observing is it yeah. could be a, a possible theory of that. Yeah, I think there there could be something to that. And, and if she had gone, if they had gone out on the road as you know, like Pat Benatar and the Crimes of Passion or something like that, you right. know, people might have looked deeper into into who was playing with her. You're you're right because uh, a person who was on both of our shows is Liberty Devito, and a lot of people don't know who Liberty is, and he is one of the great rock and roll drummers of all time. Absolute dream come true interview for us. And I'm sure you as well. Yeah. Playing on every single Billy Joel studio album, except for the earliest ones before the band came into play, but the Billy Joel band, mm -hmm. not the one that's out there now. Now it is, I hate to say it. It's Billy Joel. And the collection of musicians, but mm -hmm. this was the Billy Joel band. Yeah. The core of that group. And Liberty was the guy pounding the skins behind it, driving these classic albums. So to me, it was, uh, we were, we both got to talk to a living legend. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. He was just a delight to talk to. Fantastic interview and so gracious with his time. He's, it was amazing. I was just kept looking at the clock going, he hasn't, he hasn't waved me off or looked at his watch. So I'm just going to keep going. <laughs> Um, let's dive into side one. You ready? Hell yeah, let's do it. All right. So it kicks off with Promises in the Dark written by Geraldo and Benatar. And this is a, not a common theme in Pat's music. There are not a lot of just Geraldo Benatar, um, compositions. And this was a, a very personal song for Pat that she wrote most of the lyrics to. And because she was embarrassed to have Neil read them to get her, give her feedback while she was standing there, she slipped them under the door so that he could read them and said, yeah, get back to me on, on what you think. And uh, so great story. It's the second single off the album released uh, September 25th, 1981. It only made it to number 38 on the Billboard Hot 100 and number 16 on the mainstream U.S. rock charts. And... It's just crazy to me. A song this good didn't get higher than 38, although 1981 is a pretty good year for music. Yeah, but hit status aside, it's one of her signature tunes. Mm -hmm. I mean, to this day, it still makes every Pat Benatar concert, and there's a reason for that. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a song with, for me, uh, one of the best vocal performances 
ever that she has put down in the bridge of this song. The bridge of this song just by itself. And I think that's kind of, for me, a lot of the times is the sign of a good artist is how are their bridges? The bridge sometimes can elevate a song, sometimes can knock a song down. For Pat, this bridge is phenomenal with the, uh, you know, your heart says try again and that note that she hits. And then oh. Neil just blasts in with that solo, uh, just absolutely ripping the strings off that guitar. And it just all works. And it's the whole spectrum because the beginning of that bridge She's soft and sultry. Mm -hmm. And as the bridge is building, you could hear the aggression coming out in her voice till she hits that high note. And you got, I get the goosebumps on my arms just thinking about it. This song actually dupes you because the album starts off. You think you're listening to a power ballad. Mm -hmm. It so starts off slow. Mm -hmm. Minute and six seconds. You're feeling like this is just going to come in with maybe some strings and it's going to be a power you know, just not even a power ballad, just a ballad to start the album. Then at 107, it just flips the script and this assault of rock and roll starts. And to me, what a fantastic way to open an album. Mm -hmm. Because you start thinking, oh, wow, is Pat going soft here? And then all of a sudden it's like, hell no. We're doing <laughs> just the opposite of that. We're going balls to the wall and we're going to do it this entire album. And to me we talked about Neil being underrated, but that guitar solo, how he didn't become a mainstream discussed guitar players beyond me. Mm -hmm. Unbelievable. And we had posted this on Twitter today that we're going to be talking about the sound tonight. And two of our followers, DFO rights and Jeff Scoble chimed in saying, this is their favorite song on the album. And to me, it's tied. It's tied for, I have two favorites that depending on the day, one could overtake the other. Mm -hmm. So for today in this moment, <laughs> this is my number two song, but tomorrow morning it could easily just jump right back into the number one spot. Just kind of yeah. going back and forth there. Yeah. I thought about, I thought about asking you to bring your song rankings into this and I decided against it because it's, it's hard to do. And I thought about my own, and I, I think this is probably two for me, but only by, like, the slimmest of margins. Like you said, like, on another day, it might actually be – I might be more in the mood for that one. But what I love about this as an opener is it takes you on a ride. It's just a a journey, and it just leaves you breathless at the end of it. it it's it, Who else puts a countdown in the middle of a song? Oh, I love that part. They count in the final d dark in the final chorus. It gives you the feeling that it was done live in the studio. Whether it was or not, I don't know. But I would, I feel like they're all just standing around in a circle. And that's where you get that bleed <laughs> in the microphone. One, two, three, four. Yeah. Like it's just, man, you could feel the energy. Yeah. And I actually am glad they included that. Yeah, same. without it, I feel like it almost might have felt like the song was ending. Yeah. On like a cliffhanger. And this way, it feels like it just feels so live and so raw and so real. So perfect way to start the album. Yeah. I mean, they just bring they bring the song to a just a stop and then one, two, three, four, da, and then just blam right into the uh the big finish. So um perfect way to start the album, promises in the dark. And then we go to the other single, Fire and Ice. And this one was uh, co-written by Tom Kelly, uh, who has written a lot of hits in his time. Uh, the, uh, the combination of Kelly and Billy Steinberg have written some of the biggest hits in pop music, like Virgin, uh, Alone by Heart, uh, I Touch Myself by the Vinyls, uh, just True Colors. Tons of great songs, but he wrote, co-wrote this song with Scott St. Clair Sheets and Pat Benatar. It peaked at number 17 on the Hot 100, number two on Mainstream Rock. And yet, for only getting to 17 on the Hot 100, Pat Benatar won a Grammy Award for Best Female Rock Vocal Performance in 1982, her second Grammy. And just a, what, what I think Pat Benatar does better than anybody probably is she rocks mid-tempo songs and that's what yeah. this is 
this it really is and i could say beyond a shadow of a doubt i see why this was the lead single definitely the most radio friendly Mm -hmm. song on the album but again a dynamic between the verse and chorus there's a push pull because that verse is kind of soft and sultry then Mm -hmm. it kicks in and there's this dynamic where when you're listening to this on vinyl it actually gets louder the band kicks in you feel it and that's something why with modern music with brick walling i feel like you kind of lose that experience but as a kid i remember when the chorus ended you could almost hear yourself talking and then when the band kicked in with the chorus you couldn't anymore at least based on how loud my parents played music when i was a kid <laughs> yeah you're right it's the today you don't get the the dynamic range in in a lot of the music that's put out there thanks rick rubin thanks buddy mm-hmm. uh mm-hmm. i have a volume knob if i want something to be louder i'll turn it up i don't need everything to be louder than everything else oh it's the worst it's the worst <laughs> but again this song blistering guitar solo in it yeah just enough heat to fit the mid-tempo aspect of the song. Like I said, Geraldo's playing to the song. He could have taken this completely over the top. And you could tell he was teetering with that edge in this. But he towed the line so perfectly because he never overplayed the song. Mm -hmm. And when I posted about this album on Twitter, Comfortably Days chimed in saying that this was his favorite song. Yeah, This would probably be my number three, because again, this first side is simply perfect. (laughs) So no matter which way I slice it, I'll just spoiler alert, my top four songs are coming from side A. Yeah. Because of how much I love this side. Although no disrespect to side two which or side b which we'll get to later yeah sure and and yeah i i see this as the first single because it's probably the most like her previous singles it has the pat benatar chorus signature chorus sound i think even though it's a you know it's a little it's a little slower but i mean so was you better run that was a little slower also Two so fantastic songs there fantastic yeah so then uh, we go to Just Like Me, and it's, it's a cover. Pat's always done lots of covers throughout her career. This is from Paul Revere and the Raiders, and it was originally released in 1965, made it all the way to number 11, but I was not familiar with this song until I had this album. And and that's surprising because my dad has like all those, those old bands. He had that stuff all, all over on eight tracks laying around that we used to listen to. Uh, not... Uh, Not quite the success she had with the Young Rascals cover, You Better Run, but another solid song and a rocker. I will say this. She picked the two most perfect cover songs that could go on this album out of all the cover songs she's done. Mm -hmm. You Better Run, absolutely fantastic. I don't know if it would fit the vibe because just like me, the original by Paul Revere and the Raiders, which I had gone back and listened to when I found out and first discovered it was a cover, it's a rock song, but it's not a rocking song. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. What Neil did with the guitar work in this song brings it from a rock song with some pop sensibilities into a straight ahead rock, hard rock song. Mm -hmm. He elevates this song to me. This is the definitive version of this song. Although my punk side of me has to mention 1982 circle jerks, wild (laughs) in the streets, do a fun cover of it. Totally different than Pat Benatar's. But to me, Pat Benatar's is the gold standard. Again, that push pull of the chorus, the, the verse is so restrained and you almost feel like there's an intensity brewing Mm -hmm. at the and then the chorus is when it starts spilling over the sides and the pot starts boiling over and her voice is shredding this yeah she's screaming it with authority and it's perfect i absolutely love it it's toeing the line with heavy metal during the choruses of this uh this song very very heavy uh chorus on this song so Just Like Me, the third track, and then we come to the title track, and this one was written by Billy Steinberg about his mother. 
uh, and it, it comes off as as being as being sort of reading like a relationship between um, a woman and like a wealthy man, which the video sort of uh, sort of portrayed that too. Uh, this is my favorite song on the album, and my favorite Pat Benatar song of all time. This is a the way she sings it, the lyrics, everything about this thing sells sells me on this song. This is um, and and also I have to cop to the fact that the video helped sell this to me as well because you saw in that video Pat's toughness, but you also saw her vulnerability. She shows her vulnerability in that song as well, and it just really worked for me. Pretty sophisticated for an early MTV video. Uh, they had some green screen going on, some split screen stuff, uh, some special effects. Uh, I'm not really sure what Neil was doing with the, that sort of shirtless uh, look with the, uh, I don't know, it's some shirt or something over his head, like a shake. And then he was playing that pink BC Rich guitar. And um, you had Pat throwing drinks and pushing a guy into the pool and flipping him off of his hammock and stuff and being <laughs> kind of violent. It was it was uh, it was pretty amazing. There was a lot going on in that video, but the song itself, just the the juxtaposition of the vulnerability that she shows and the way she sings the the chorus, and then that fantastic guitar over the chorus. That riff that he plays over the chorus is amazing. Yeah, I'm shocked this wasn't released. I know the video is out there. They never officially released it as a single. Yeah. This is also my other favorite song on the album. And with that being said, Shadows of the Night's my number one. It's Precious Time and Promises in the Dark for my number two. Yeah. So if we ever have you on, let's say, for a <laughs> Pat Benatar episode, I've already spoiled three of the songs of my 10. Yeah. Probably. <laughs> Maybe, depending on the day. But this song is so dynamic and heavy because the push-pull that I talked about earlier, what Neil's doing in the verse, when the snare hits and he's doing those bounce on the guitar and he's making the guitar almost rhythmic with the stops he's doing, making those snare hits vulnerable because the song just kind of empties after that snare hit. Because the guitar is stopping on the snare. It just adds this tension to the verse. Mm -hmm. And then the pre-chorus into the chorus is just step up, step up, step up. And that guitar solo, the opening of it, the beginning of it, dare I use the word, he's subdued at the beginning of this. <laughs> yeah. But this is an example of a song that he could have easily went right into it full fire and overplayed the song but the subdued nature of the guitar really builds that tension and then at the end of the solo he does enough pyrotechnics to bring you back into the heavier part of the song mm -hmm. so the story that he tells musically in the guitar solo itself is something that needs to be pointed out and applauded because this is one of his finest moments on album for me personally and I miss the days when album sequencing was done for vinyl because this song is absolutely perfectly sequenced. I could not see this ending the album. Mm -hmm. I could not see this opening a side. No, I couldn't, couldn't see this in the middle of a side. It needs to be a set one closer, side A, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. And it's in the perfect spot. Yeah. So it elevates the album as a whole where it was placed in the nine songs. Yeah. It's the, it's the song the band plays. I don't know about Pat Benatar when she plays live, but it's for me, just the metaphor is it's the song the band plays before they break and come back for their encore. It's the one that leaves you wanting more. Yes. Definitely. So, and, and then speaking of Neil Giraldo, I don't know what you call that. I don't know if it's a bent note or whatever, that first guitar note to lead off that song that, oh. that just kind of, yeah, Bounce. that leads you yeah. into that staccato um, rhythmic guitar that you were talking about. That first one, it just sets the tone so nicely. Yeah. And this, this is a song that was put out in the eighties 
but feels timeless. It does. You couldn't tell me that sounds like an 80s song, the way it was recorded. Mm -hmm. There wasn't the overly reverberated 80s drum sound. Yep. This sounded like a 70s rock record living in the 80s. And that's another reason why I think I love it so much because there's a kind of a timeless classic nature to, to the sound and the production of it. Yeah. And I think Roger Caps and, and Myron uh, Grombacher, like I was talking about before we got into the songs, is that they laid down that that foundation for Pat and Neil to play over and sing over. And it it's it's not a it's not a busy song musically. There's a lot going on in it, but it doesn't ever seem crowded. There's a ton of space in this song. Yes, and there's a lot when you listen to this on vinyl or you listen to it on a good system. If you want to focus in on each musician, you're going to hear a whole spectrum of, like a whole different perspective on the song. And I love that about it. It's so open and spread out musically. And again, that could be part of that Sound City Studios recording because they were known for that really wide open. Think about Fleetwood Mac's Rumors also mm -hmm. recorded there. So much going on on that album, but you could also listen and hone in on every single instrument if you wanted to. And it's just a beautiful sounding album. Now, the dynamics you were talking about earlier mm -hmm. between um, Roger and Myron, I think the next song is just a shining example of those guys really locking it down. Yeah. Really, really, really. So let's get into side two. Uh, the uh, Geraldo penned It's a Tough Life. Pat Benatar goes reggae. Odd. <laughs> it's odd. And the thing is, it works. It's a rock reggae song. But when you listen to it in the context of the album, had they not gone into that reggae signature, I feel like this would have been a song that our friends at Records Revisited Ben and Wayne might put it as a one or a two, but the fact that there's this reggae in it, it is a very memorable part of the album mm -hmm. for better or for worse. Because like you said, Pat Benatar fans are kind of sour on this album. And I wonder if this is one of the reasons mm -hmm. because they don't sign up for reggae when they sign up for <laughs> Pat Benatar. And I, but I love the fact it's an ex exploration and the fact that they didn't keep the whole song reggae, that they still did this punk-esque chorus in it that just is like flicking a switch and it goes from, I don't know, a, a cup of coffee to a line of cocaine in, in intensity. <laughs> it's like, it, it, it totally goes off the rails, but it works. It works so well. So it's a very memorable, memorable track on this album. I wouldn't say it's my favorite, mm -hmm. but it's one that I truly respect. Yeah, and I think you're right. I think that this is part of the reason that a lot of the the, the big time Pat Benatar fans don't rate the album as highly as some of, of her other albums is that m almost all of the reviews I read said, uh, the side side one's pretty good, but side two dot dot dot, and then, you know, then they start bagging on side two. But it's interesting, you brought up uh, Roger and Myron and my note for this song says the rhythm section doing a lot of the heavy lifting here. Right? It, it, and that's the thing. Neil left it to them. Mm -hmm. Because he is not overplaying on this song either. He could have, but the rhythm holds the show down. And that transition from reggae to rock or punk or whatever you call it, if that was sloppy, the song would completely fall apart. But these guys were locked in on this song. Yeah. And it would have been easy for Neil to put, you know, to push those guys aside as the producer and the lead guitarist. Um, you know, it would have been easier for him to not give them the space and not, not let them do so much heavy lifting, but I'm glad that he did. Cause it does make the song work for me. And it's, you know, this, it's a song that maybe the, you know, the, there's been some consternation on the internet about the lyrics that, you know, he's sort of, uh, Oh, you know, poor, poor me, uh, you know, the, the rich people in LA are, are not nice or whatever, you know, it's, but, uh, you know, it's, 
it's fine. It, it, lyrically, it's fine. I don't think it's one of the better songs, but I, uh, lyrically, but I do think it's a good song, and it's it's certainly not a song that I would ever skip. Exactly. Exactly. It's a memorable, attention grabbing song. Mm -hmm. It's not forgettable. Yeah. And I don't have any songs on here that I skip when I play the CD. I, I play the whole thing all the way through. But let's get into song two on side two, because this one, I didn't even know this until we started researching this album. And I, I read the liner notes as a kid, and for some reason it never connected with me that Neil Giraldo wrote this song, Take It Any Way You Want It, with Martin Briley. And I love Martin Briley. I am a huge Martin Briley fan. Uh, people may remember his... His big hit, uh, The Salt in My Tears. Uh, but uh, I know him for more than that because I, I have, I'm, a, I'm a, a music nerd with Martin Briley albums, plural. And uh, once I read that he was a co-writer of this song, I was shocked that I never noticed it because it is so Martin Briley. And take it any way you want it. As a result of it being so Martin Briley, it's my favorite song on side two. Wow. You see, and I'm going to have to counter that a little bit because to me, it is one of the more straight ahead rock songs on this album. It's not a hard rock song. It's just a mm -hmm. rock song. And the problem with this song is for me that it is this valley between two very memorable for better or for worse peaks on the mm -hmm. album in the songs. It's a tough life and Evil Genius, which we'll get to in a, in a minute here. But to me, this song is kind of cursed by album placement. Whereas Precious Time was in the perfect spot, I feel like had they flip-flopped Evil Genius and Take It Any Way You Want, this song would have had a better position on the album because the these two very memorable parts of the album would have been back-to-back. And this mm -hmm. might have brought you back down to earth. But when you're sandwiched in between them, I feel like this song gets lost in the sauce on a listen. I don't ever skip it mm -hmm. because I love this album start to finish. But to me, that's the one critique I have with it. If you flip flop this song and Evil Genius, I think you take an album that's a 9.5 and you bring it up to like a 9.8 or a 9.9. .9. See, it's interesting that you brought that up because my note on take it any way you want it, is that I would have put it fourth on side two and gone after uh, the reggae song, I would have gone with the hard rocker Evil Genius second, and then I would have uh, gone hard to believe and then put take it any way you want it as the lead into the album Closer, which we'll talk about momentarily. It was written by some famous people. Uh, but yeah, I'm I'm a Martin Briley fan, and this song, once you know it's Martin Briley, you 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 just go, wow, yeah, that's definitely a Martin Briley song. I, mm -hmm. I'm surprised I never noticed that before. But uh, you know, it's because he is he writes pop rock songs that are melodic, and they have a, a certain type of flow to them, and this has that type of flow, which is is right up my alley. So let's get into Evil Genius, the other uh, Geraldo Benatar song on the album. This song has great energy. The saxophones, uh, multiple saxophones, add a different dimension to it. Uh, it's a little odd lyrically. <laughs> a lot of what I read today was I, I read a, a lot of disparity. People either loved or hated Evil Genius on this album. And I love the way Pat sings it. She just really, really sells it. Whether the whether the lyrics are a little ridiculous or not, uh, it's serious subject matter, uh, but it, it I don't think it quite pulls off what they were hoping it would pull off lyrically, but she makes you believe it. This song is one word, heavy. This is a heavy, heavy song. I could hear a band like Shinedown covering this song now and it working on modern rock radio. Whoever's idea it was to add a horn section onto one of the heaviest songs on this album <laughs> was genius because on paper, were they an evil genius? Evil, oh, there you go. <laughs> <But I'm full. laughs> I'll tell you on paper, it's like, if you were pitching this, like, Oh, that heavy breakdown in the middle, let's add horns. People would kind of look at you funny, but the way Neil produced this and the way he played the guitar solo, where he kind of was 
very subdued for the first 30 seconds. And then at about two minutes and 18 seconds in, you start hearing these horns underneath this subdued guitar playing. And then by 2.30, the horns, are, the horns are in full effect. And then he just starts getting heavier. And the solo goes into, dare I say, metal leaning. It's not a metal song, but there's metal elements in that riffing that's going on during that solo. And mm -hmm. to me, it's probably one of the best guitar riffs on the album. I love it. And... Once again, brief hints of pyrotechnics on the gu guitar solo, but he never overplays it. It stays where it needs to be. He played just enough for it. And it's one of the most memorable songs on the album for the horn section because it was left field. But also yeah. for the fact on side two, you've already had reggae. Now you've <laughs> got horn sections on this quasi metal, almost Black Sabbath-esque riff. <laughs> like what the hell is happening here and to me it is a very creative way to side be an album because the first side is your Pat Benatar what you know about or what you love mm -hmm. side two is a little bit of the I'd call it the after party <laughs> a little bit of experimenting going on yeah. here and I could see why it, it causes such a rift between Pat Benatar fans either loving or hating it because some people kind of want fans to stay in their wheelhouse yeah and this is like ACDC trying something else <laughs> and it to me it works but to some people it's a, a crash course in brain surgery to use another musical reference like it just is not smart <laughs> Yeah. I like it, though, personally. Yeah, I do, too. And I think stylistically, because there's so much variety on side two, that's where you get the the critique that it's uneven. It's, it's that it's a it's, it's I mean, it's not a perfect album, but it's a great album. And yes, there, it's it's got a perfect album side, but it's not necessarily a perfect album. But um, Evil Genius, I, I love the energy of the song. It's just it, it always is one that will, you know elevate your mood immediately uh at least for me uh and See, then oh. go ahead i was gonna say in my mind because you were talking about the song kind of rotating the different songs around mm -hmm. and i had mentioned shadows of the night i would have loved to hear it on this album and coming out of evil genius into shadows of the night giving you that radio anthem for side two Mm -hmm. I think would have brought a cohesive nature to this side because it's that Pat that everybody's familiar with and it works so well for get nervous, but you throw it right here in the middle of side two and you're kind of grounding this experimental side a little bit. You're yeah. kind of leveling the playing field with a little more familiarity. I could see so that. That's kind of my, 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 uh, my argument for that song being a perfect fit for this album. Yeah. And I would like to, I think it would be interesting to hear that song without the 80s sheen on it too, to, to hear it a little bit more raw. Yeah. Because I think it would still hold up really well, even because I haven't seen Pat live, but I'm sure that it oh. probably comes off it probably comes off a little raw in the uh in the live setting. Uh, or a little there's at least a, a little more raw than it does on the album anyway. Yeah, there's a live C D and DVD you can get. I highly recommend it. It's called Live at 35, I think unbelievable i've watched it with my daughters before they opened with shadows of the night okay all the harmonies going like just like the album and when it kicks in there is the keyboard but the guitars are more front and center mm -hmm. and there's an energy to it that i think you'd really appreciate yeah i'll have to check that out uh yeah pat not seeing pat is one of the big holes in my uh in my concert going life and um I'm trying to close those up as as I go, but uh, haven't been able to do that one so far. Hard to Believe is the fourth song on the album, written by Neil Giraldo and Myron Grombacher. And for me, this is a sort of a power pop offering that is, I don't skip it, but for me, it's probably the closest thing on the album to a meh song for me. It's, it's fine. I don't love it. I don't hate it. It's there. Um, sometimes I'll sing along with it. Sometimes I won't. But um, 
for me, if I were to rank these songs on this album, that would be the lowest ranking. And it's not a slight on the song. It's just something's got to be last. And that one would be the one. Yeah, to me, this is one of the most poppiest moments on the album. You called it power pop. To me, if it wasn't for the guitar flourishes that Neil added throughout the song, it would have been much poppier. So I feel like he kind of brought the rock in to make it fit Precious Time. But you swap this song out and you remove it and you put it in Shadows of the Night. And to me, hard to believe would fit more on Get Nervous. Yeah, I think you're right. Because of that pop leaning sensibility in this song. Now, when I brought it up on Twitter, people chimed in with their different favorites. Josephine chimed in, said she got this album on her 11th birthday, calls this deep track her favorite on the album, which I thought was interesting because to me, I hear something more that would fit on 82's Get Nervous, swapping it out with the other song. So to me, if I would probably lean closer to where you are, Mike, and say that this would rank lowest on a fantastic album. So I don't hate the song, but to me, thank God there was a song after it to close the album. Because <laughs> I feel like if Hard to Believe closed the album, it might have ended on a little bit of a want want. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think it would have been the right, the right closer for sure. And uh yeah, I saw that that tweet from Josephine. I was like, Oh, that's interesting. I, I would I, not I, have expected that, but we all like different flavors. And I love that kind of conversation. Cause it makes you go back. When I listened to the album right before we recorded, I put it on for the last hour just to kind of have it in the background as I was having dinner with the kids. Mm-hmm. I listened to that song a little bit closer after what she said. And it's like, I could see it. I could see where, somebody could gravitate to this song. Yeah. So it brought a new perspective. So I, I, I appreciate that, Josephine. Yeah. So thank you. And it is definitely a deeper track on the album. There's no question yeah. about that. Actually, I don't know. The next song is probably, <laughs> I, I never heard of this song before, the last one on the album. Yeah, side two, the, the <laughs> bringing the curtain down with Helter Skelter, cover from a uh, an obscure band from Liverpool, England, and <laughs> Italy. <laughs> A an extremely credible rocking version of the Beatles classic. I find that as much as you know, you look at the Beatles and you go, these guys set the standard in so many ways. This is one of their songs that I think I've heard several versions that I think reach the level of the Beatles or surpass it. Uh, which is a surprising thing to say when you're talking about the Beatles, but I think this is a fantastic cover. And the energy that that Pat and Neil and the band bring to this song make it a fantastic album closer. What's there to to say about Helter Skelter that (laughs) hasn't been said before? So I'm not even going to get into the history of the song, but this song has been covered countless times by massive bands. Motley Crue, U2, Aerosmith, Oasis, Fish, Government Mule, Soundgarden, Roger Daltrey. He was in some band called The Who. I don't know. You might have heard of him. (laughs) But I might catch some flack for this, but Pat Benatar's version is the best of all of those bands I just mentioned. And it is exactly, to me at least, in my humble opinion, on par with the Beatles. I like them exactly the same. I don't know if I could choose which one I like more. I think her version with the female voice and the drive she adds to it and the energy, it's a different enough version that I could look at the two songs as two separate entities Mm -hmm. and like them just the same. I don't know which one would edge out the other overall if we were to do like an all Helter Skelter version (laughs) of Playlist Wars. yeah, I don't know which one would be my favorite because to me they're both perfect versions of the song. Because let's be honest, when you cover the Beatles, if you do it poorly it could be career suicide for you as a musician realistically because you're going to be seen as desecrating one of people's holy trinity of bands (laughs) yeah you better bring it (laughs) yeah if you don't if you don't bring at least the same level i think people are going to see it as a disservice but for her she brought it it's an exclamation point at the end of this album this is a mic drop moment when she ends this song. Yeah. 
And to me, it's the perfect closer. She nailed the cover songs. I said it on Just Like Me. I'll say it again now. The two perfect cover songs for this album, perfectly sequenced. Yeah, for sure. I, I think that Pat has, uh, between Pat and you 2 and the Beatles, those are my three ultimate forms of this song, of Helter Skelter. I think those three really are right up there neck and neck together. And, and I'll uh, throw the cruise into that. I like the cruise also. I, because I do. on Shout at the Devil, it's the perfect cover song for that album. Yeah, it really is. So think about Shout at the Devil lyrically and musically. And think about Precious Time lyrically and musically. They're two different albums. Two yeah, different very spectrums. different. Yep. And yet, Helter Skelter fits perfect on both albums. Yeah, absolutely. And it, and I think that when you when you look back at Pat's career and you look at some of the covers she's done and you know, you go back to her like I love Kate Bush and I love her version obviously of Wuthering Heights. Mm -hmm. And I when I I had already knew that song before I went back and and revisited Pat's first album, got into the deeper cuts first couple albums and I went Pat did Wuthering Heights and it's good and I like it. But it's very, very different. And I think in some ways it works really well, in other ways not so much. But I think here she really nails these covers. Unbelievable. I mean, her vocals on this, they're heavier than any other song on the album, including Evil Genius. <laughs> yeah. Like she is screaming this song, but it's not where she's blowing her voice out. It fits perfect. This version effing rocks like yeah. really <laughs> she's growling these these vocals out she's just like roaring like a lion it, there's <laughs> authority in them yeah she's telling you what's what's happening yeah she's not like offering you her opinion that maybe you should consider <laughs> she's demanding you listen to those <laughs> vocals and you feel it and to me it's the perfect album closer for this album she's not suggesting that you may be a lover, but you ain't no dancer. She's just telling you flat out. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's great. It, it, it is uh, a great way to close the album and just one of the all-time great albums in rock history, male or female. And it's criminal that she's had to wait so long to get in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Oh, God, yeah. Uh, but that's at least getting corrected. And this album for me it rep represents to me the pinnacle of her work. She's done fantastic work before, fantastic work after. But for me, this one hits the sweet spot. Again, I know I'm biased because it was my first album by her that I owned. And, uh, you know, when you're, when you're a kid and you're growing up, you get an album, you listen to it, you don't have like oh okay i got another paycheck coming up next week i'll get another album and then another album and then two more from amazon and put this one on the credit card <laughs> it's like you've got a finite amount of music and you live with those songs and you play them over and over and over and over and and they become part of who you are and that's what this album did for me well mike i have a question for you then at the induction we obviously are not privy to any of this information <laughs> does she choose a song from precious time and if so which one does she choose in her inductee performance? Because they do three, maybe four songs. Let's do some prediction time here. If she does a song from here, I feel like if I were a betting, if we're going to put money on it, I feel like she would go Fire and Ice because it was the bigger hit and got her the Grammy. But I would prefer if she did Promises in the Dark because it is a – it's a Geraldo Benatar song. It is a very personal song for her. It was, you know, she was just still a fledgling lyric writer at that time. And this is a personal story for her. And it's an amazing song. One of her best, one of her absolute best to, to the point that sometimes I would rather hear it than my favorite Pat Benatar song. So that's the one I would, I would probably think that I would like her to play. Cause I don't expect her to play precious time. Um, but Fire and Ice would be the one I would bet that she would play from this album. Yeah, Mike, I think you and I are in perfect lockstep. Although I don't 
believe she will play anything from Precious Time. If she did, I think she would go Fire and Ice first. I'd rather her mm-hmm. do Promises in the Dark. But if I were a betting man and there were Vegas odds, I would say Heartbreaker, hit me with I mean, your best, best shot. shot. Mm-hmm. Maybe Invincible or um, Maybe Invincible. We Belong as the third song. Like there's, I don't see her doing Shadows of the Night. I don't see her doing All Fired Up. I see her kind of staying in that era of, you know, the legend of Billie Jean. Mm -hmm. Uh, I could see that. Um, Pat, if you're listening to the show, I would, uh, (laughs) I would appreciate if you do La Belle Oh, that's a good one. I'd like to hear sex is a weapon, but I love that. I love that song too. Again, Mike, you need to go, you need to pick up that live DVD. There's another great version of sex is a weapon on that. And some cool stories that Neil tells on stage as well about him writing uh eight six seven five three oh nine some some fun <laughs> anecdotes in it too so great i um i took some grief on twitter for saying how much i loved the um the album uh seven the hard way really <laughs> yeah why people are like oh that's not even one of her best i'm like she's got there she's got like six better so better albums than that and i'm like mm, yeah. my yeah. mileage may vary i i think that's a very strong album but what do i know <laughs> I mean, God, I'm I'm pulling it up right now. <laughs> I, hold on here. I. I mean, it's invincible. Sex is, sex a, is a weapon. Is great. La Belle Age is obviously a invincible. Song. Was massive. Yeah. I think this is the real turning point. Where after get nervous, then you had Tropico, Tropico, which was leaning more eighties. Seven the hard way was all in the 80s bucket and mm-hmm. i feel like they started to pull back out with wide awake and dreamland because all fired up was them kind of trying to go back to mm-hmm. the rock sound so i feel like between tropico and seven in the ha- seven the hard way it really was kind of going much more pop and then they pulled it back and then obviously the 90s output which is very underrated very yeah. underrated her 90s stuff is fantastic yeah um, i'd love to hear her revisit true love but I know that's not the that, that that would not be a Grammy performance. But that's an amazing album. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely a that was definitely something that she was at a point in her career where she said, "I want to do this, so I'm going to do this, and yes. and I'm going to do this." Uh, and if it sells, it sells. If it doesn't, it doesn't. <laughs> the only thing I'm surprised is she hasn't had a studio album in 19 years now. I would love to hear more from them. Yeah, I would too. It's uh. It's unfortunate because a lot of legacy artists, there's, there's a lot, there are multiple schools of thought. There's, there are, well, there's Tears for Fears, who I just recently saw, put out a very strong new album of songs and played almost the whole album in their live show. Wow. There are bands that will put out new output, but play one song maybe of the new song at their, at their shows. And I'm thinking of like Night Ranger. Uh, Def Leppard, I think, played two or three from mm-hmm. their new album on this big tour they're on. Yeah, which to and, me, a stadium tour—that's a lot. Three songs in a stadium tour with a four bill. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty good. And then there are those that just we're just going to go play the hits because that's what people want to see and want to hear, and I'm, we're not going to go and worry about writing new songs. But um, so there's a lot of different schools of thought, and you know, none of them are necessarily right or wrong, but. Um, you know, it, it is unfortunate when you're a fan of a band that decides, yeah, we're not going to put any new albums out. We're just going to go keep playing the, playing the hits and, and, uh, making a living as a touring band and sort of give the people what they want, which sometimes the people don't know what they want, Brian. Well, I uh, think <laughs> what it is, Mike, is they're waiting for you to see them before they put a new album. I think you're the one holding this whole thing up. Well, so I go definitely. See them live yeah, I got to fix like, that. We've done it. <laughs> <laughs> I got to fix that. Yeah, because like, I mean, when I, I'm a music fan. And so if, if my album, my favorite bands put out new albums, the artists that I love put out a new album, I'm excited about that. And I want to hear it. And. You know, so many legacy artists either don't have the confidence that they can, you know, find the sound that they once had or get the album sales that they once had, which is is sad. If they if you just be true to yourself, 
like Tears for Fears did with the tipping point, you're going to put out a good album and it's going to resonate with people. And I, I'm here to tell you, after having seen them play recently, when they announced that a song was a new song, sure, it didn't get the same crowd reaction that, you know, Shout or something like that would get. But once they launched into those songs and played them and showed that those songs can stand toe to toe with their iconic hits from the 80s, I think the crowd reaction was every bit as strong. Wow. There weren't as many cameras in the air for those songs, <laughs> of course, which was actually good for me, <laughs> but as as an attendee, but uh, but yeah, I, I think that they sold those songs, I, and they probably sold their new album, a lot of copies of their new album, uh, when they did it. Actually, I shouldn't say that because I think if you bought through Ticketmaster, you got a download code to get the album anyway, so maybe they weren't oh. selling it after all, but it. And I have it on LP, so it was good to get the digital files because like it's like it's easier to just have the digital files than try to rip the album. <laughs> yes, I know that from experience. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so I I think that yeah, it would be great to have more Pat Benatar music, and I think they certainly have another good album in them. I would say so. I would hope that in twenty years, considering some of the great songs they've written, that at least a few have gotten penned. I would hope. I would hope. <laughs> Yeah, and who knows? They probably have something to say from the last two decades. Fingers crossed, Pat, <laughs> if you're listening. All right, so have we covered everything we need to cover, Brian, for this uh, this Pat Benatar Precious Time special edition of Michael's Record Collection? I would say so. I think we covered this album pretty well. And if people are out there going, wow, I you know, haven't heard this album yet or I haven't listened to this album in years, go back and give it a listen because... It's a lot of gems in this one, really. It's a truly fantastic album. Start yeah. To finish. And with uh, apologies to my friends Ben and Wayne, this is an album that should be revisited. This is a record that should be revisited and, and revisited often. Yeah. So, uh, Brian, why don't you tell people where they can find you and your show online? And, and more importantly, because we didn't bring this up before, your music. Oh, okay. Well, thank you. You can find Playlist Wars at playlistwarspodcast.com. That's where you go. You can see all of our episodes and vote in the latest round of 10 episodes after you listen, of course. Don't just randomly go and vote for people, even though we, I appreciate it if it comes my way, by all means. But regardless, listen to the episode first and vote with an opinion. We also have a Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash Playlist Wars, which we offer some early downloads and special uh, perks for people that support us there you can find us on social media at on facebook and twitter at playlist wars on instagram at playlist wars podcast and like michael's record collection anywhere you listen to podcasts apple itunes spotify amazon google we're everywhere you can find us musically thank you for that mike i can be found at brian com. i've got my album posted there digitally unfortunately CDs are no longer available, but what I did is I put a 40 song mix of all the songs from my albums up on my Bandcamp page, which is bandcamp.briancolburn.com. 40 songs, 10 bucks, all original music I've written over the last two decades. And it's stuff that uh, acoustic leaning very much in the vein of Tom Petty, somebody we've talked about, you and I, mm -hmm. offline since we've gotten to know each other. It's something we both share a common bond with. And it's definitely an influence of mine, I think, comes out in some of the songwriting that I do. Yeah. And um, I know you're doing some live shows with Colburn and company. Are you, do you guys have a Facebook page or you just throw stuff out from your personal Facebook and Twitter? Oh, you can find us at Colburn and company on Facebook as well as Instagram. Okay, cool. And then on Twitter, I am just at Brian Colburn. And that is where I talk about all the shows, some podcast stuff. And then I complain about the New York Giants anytime that's uh, necessary, which over the last few years has been a lot. He really does. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. All right. Uh, Brian, thank you so much for being back on the show and uh, talking a little Pat Benatar with me and giving me an, uh, an excuse to listen to this album again over and over a few times. And, uh, you know, I'm going to certainly have you back on again to talk about another artist in the future because – Michael's record collection doesn't stop growing. No. Well, I want to thank you, dude. It's an absolute 
pleasure and honor to talk to you. I have so much fun on our conversations. Love talking music with you. Love the friendship we've built over the podcast over the last year and change. Look forward to having you back on Playlist Wars again so you could seek revenge. Maybe a Pat Benatar episode, although you know Gomez is strong with his 80s stuff, so he might kung fu us in that one too. Who knows? <laughs> but would love to have you back on, and thank you so much for bringing me on to talk music with you.